We don't have a chance against bandits. And when we lose, they'll slaughter us all, down to the last unborn child. I've had enough. Better to risk it all than to live like this. Kill or be killed. Welcome to the Magic Lantern Podcast, an ongoing informal discussion of the films we love and the things we love about them. I am Erica Long. And I am Cole Rolaine. Each episode of the Magic Lantern will be devoted to one film that we alternately select and we will discuss why it is significant to us. Just a note, whether the film is a classic or a more contemporary title, this will be an in-depth discussion that will include explicit plot details and potential spoilers. We are at episode 171 today, and we are going back to Erica for an epic choice this time. What do you have for us? Boy, I picked a big one, didn't I? And that is Seven Samurai from 1954, co-written, edited, and directed by Akira Kurosawa. And the Seven Samurai are played by Toshiro Mifune, Takashi Shimura, Daisuke Kato, Isayo Kimura, Minoru Chiaki, Seiji Miyaguchi, and Yoshio Inaba. In 1586, during the Sengoku period, a village of desperate farmers hire seven ronin, who are masterless samurai, to combat bandits who will return after the harvest to steal their crops. Now, I've got some fun facts for you. Some okay. of these you may know already. All right, let's hear them. They were new for me. So at the time that this was made, it was the most expensive film in Japan it took about a year to shoot, and it was the second highest grossing domestic film in Japan in 1954 when it came out. Kurosawa, this blows my mind, he built a registry to track all the villagers and created their family trees. And through this process, he and his co-writers were able to also base all of the seven samurai upon historical samurai. And last but not least, the production was so stressful that Toshiro Mufune threatened Kurosawa with a gun on set. That's a little Kinski Herzog action there. It kind of sounds like he got pushed to the edge, I guess. Now, I've seen this several times at this point. How about you? Do you have previous experiences watching this? Anything that really comes to mind? Oh, just every single time, basically. I've seen this numerous times myself, and I have to go all the way back to thank Leonard Leff for this one. I know I've mentioned him to you before, and he actually lives down here in Austin now, just coincidentally doing curbside service at the library. I took books out to his wife just the other day. I hadn't seen him in years, was working at a branch that I don't typically work at, and lo and behold, I see the name Lef. I thought, maybe? And yeah, so I got to pass on through her. Thanks again for all the things that he did, the mentoring, him basically setting me on the path to loving world cinema. That's wonderful. I'm so glad that you got to do that. Yeah, he was one of my professors at Oklahoma State way back in the day, and he taught a film as literature class when I was a freshman. Now, I didn't actually take the class. I found out about it too late in the semester, but I did crash their screening of Fellini's La Strada, and this was my very first experience with someone truly presenting a movie. He didn't just roll the projector. He had notes. He gave context. He took questions after... And I know it seems kind of run of the mill for a lot of us now who have something like a film society at our disposal or the way the discourse has just changed. And so much of this information is available to us from all kinds of sources. But at the time, I felt like it opened up a whole new world for me. And so that experience led me down a path of exploring more world cinema and Seven Samurai came almost immediately after that. We had a great video store in Stillwater called Showbiz Video, and I made my way through their international and classic section over the ensuing couple of years. So the first time was on VHS at home. But I've also been lucky enough to see this on the big screen too, which of course is just the optimal way to see this. So much action and movement. The screen seems sometimes like it can barely contain everything. Well, I don't have nearly as great of an experience to relate for the first part of that story, but the last part was all me. I got to see this at the Paramount on the big screen. That was so fun, having only before seen it on a crappy VHS copy. Though I have to say, it is kind of fun to get a two-disc set and have to stop and then put the other cartridge in. You mean tape, not disc, right? I do. Yeah, those bricks. 
Those were some of the most fun things to ever check out from the video store. At the library, they'd be wrapped in rubber bands. But so anyway, regardless of our experience, this is truly a foundational movie. It's spine number two for Criterion. And I don't think I'm overstating the point to say that it is so influential, it's been remade, revamped, whatever, stolen so many times, discussed, influenced other people. And when I watch it, I do feel like I am watching history get made. I'm with you. It's nearly impossible to overstate its importance. Do you feel a little bit like it's intimidating maybe covering a film like this because so much has been said about it? We obviously just approach this as enthusiasts. It's just fun to have the conversation. But with a linchpin like this, with one this big, does it feel sometimes like it's just impossible to take on? Too late now. <laughs> and uh, should I have picked On Golden Pond instead? No, you chose just fine, you old poop. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, are you ready to get into the film? Yeah, let's do it. By the way, just from the very first seconds, you could put that black and white Toho Studio logo up there with all of my logo favorites. Yeah, same for me. To me, it is side by side with the RKO radio tower, probably just after Universal and a little airplane. That's always going to be my favorite. And you know, of course, that you're incorrect. The best universal one is with the shining stars. But yes, same order for me. Okay, well, let's get into it. The stakes are so dire for these farmers. And we get a quick rundown of why things are so bad. Land tax, forced labor, war, drought. The gods want us farmers dead, they say. So let's look at some of the historical context to understand what led up to this point. Let's get a little history lesson right here. Bear with me. This is the Sengoku period, and it would very soon become completely illegal for peasants to possess weapons. Samurai, though, were allowed to have two swords. Hideyoshi is the ruler of Japan at this point, and he had been putting an end to the wars and the squabbles between different lords of regions. And that meant that a lot of samurai, though, were out of jobs. So they become ronin, like I mentioned, the masterless samurai, and also mercenaries quite often. But we still have this incredibly rigid caste system in place. So with the countryside in somewhat of disarray, samurai can also become bandits. So to these farmers, there's practically no distinction between samurai warriors and bandits who come to rape and pillage their areas. Before we get too far, I want to go back to something that I think is very important. This thing that you mentioned, the gods want us farmers dead. To me, nothing is more important than that line in terms of setting the tone at the very outset. The very first thing we hear the terrified villagers do is question God. They've been reduced to settling for subsistence living, and now they're faced with the prospect of having to beg bandits even for that. And Rikichi maybe just intuitively, he knows what must be done, but we watch him here in this meeting with the other villagers. He is quite literally outside their circle. And this theme returns, too. Later, one of the villagers postulates that the next world beyond may be just as full of suffering as this one. This is a culture that has completely lost faith. Backs couldn't be more against the wall. It reminds me a lot of Harlan County, USA. Definitely. Good point. And gun thugs are gun thugs. So, when we look at the samurai film as being a staple of the film culture, though, what do you think, or do you think his films are different than other samurai and Bushido films? What makes Kurosawa different? I think a lot of it has to do with how Kurosawa addresses this idea of what a hero is. There's a lot of gray area in that for him. In an ensemble piece like this, especially, you'll see the way that morality ebbs and flows between some of the characters and the checks and balances that they provide each other that keep things headed mostly in the right direction. But more interestingly, I think, in something like Yojimbo, those conflicts are housed within one single character, but we still get that Kurosawa anti-hero. So basically, his samurai films aren't just white hat, black hat melodramas. These are vastly more complex characters. And then add to that... Most of the time, because he's pulling from all of this turmoil in his real life, he is dealing with the idea of a period when Japanese society was in flux. Well, you've definitely got way more experience than me in that genre. And 
I totally agree with you. I think it's the upending of some of these conventions, like you mentioned, because he never hesitates from exploring the dark side of the samurai tradition. And also, I think, liberally putting in questioning of the Second World War and how the military government perpetrated this idea of this code. And where did that get anybody? So back to the film. One of my very favorite openings the percussion in the credits becomes the thunder of approaching hooves and then the eventual sound of that water wheel of the mill. And it was raining very hard on the day I watched this, which I felt was incredibly appropriate. Did you know, though, that the film was supposed to start a different way? Yes, I did know that. It was supposed to be with the bandits attacking a different village and us seeing the aftermath of that. But he decided to cut that sequence, started in an unassuming way. And I love it because to me, just like with the line about the gods, it shows how little say the farmers have in their own fates. But we learn that the bandits plan to come back at harvest time. So the clock is ticking and the farmers are terrified. There's a faction that wants to try appeasement because as they say, the farmer's lot is to endure there's another faction that seeks out wisdom from the old man of the mill, which you started to touch upon. And the old man says, fight. So the villagers have to go into town and try to find some quote unquote hungry samurai to fight for them. And then we're off to the races. So how about we talk about this screenwriting process? Okay. Because like we said, this incredible world has been created. I mentioned before the registry, the family tree of every villager whether we even meet them or not. And there was actually going to initially be six samurai, but seven has such a good ring to it. And there were so many innovations that happened in this film, things that may not have appeared here first, but they really seem to coalesce in this film. And I think most of us think of this as a touchstone. I think that's important to actually point out, the coalescing that you're talking about. It's not that he was completely innovative in terms of these ideas or these themes that he's treating. It's just that he was the first and or most impressive in terms of deciding what to pick and put together to make this whole. One of my favorites being assembling a team to perform a mission, and we'll get into that later as well. So with the screenplay in place, let's talk about that apparently very arduous, and I can imagine so, year-long shoot. It took 148 shooting days spread out over the year to be exact. I want to talk about the set first. That village is astounding. And it wasn't the peasant village set that already existed at Toho Studios. Instead, they constructed a whole new village out in Shizuoka. It's because Kurosawa was insisting on a level of authenticity. It had to come from the real thing. And it rained a whole lot. Apparently it was freezing cold certain times. There weren't enough horses and it got super tense. Yeah, all this work shows up on screen. I can't imagine this any other way. All that attention to detail that you're talking about, developing the registry of the villagers, family histories, legacies, the view of that village from up on the hillside, it completely gives you a sense of the vulnerability of that location. And then the map angle, I think that's completely brilliant. I love how much of the film is centered on understanding the physical layout of the village. As things progress, I have a real grasp of the geography. And as a result, I'm even more heavily invested in this plan and how they can protect these farmers, even at this numerical disadvantage. Yeah, I think we're put directly in the place of the farmers. We understand how life or death truly this situation is. Now, how do you feel, especially in the beginning, about their rage, but also their just impotent frustration towards bandits and samurai? And would you personally choose appeasement? If I was in this situation, I know you can never really tell until that comes. I hope I would never choose appeasement. Because does it ever work? No. Has it ever worked? When you're pushed to the limit, you have to fight back. There's no reason for them to take their boot off your neck unless you make them. So Rikichi is right, of course. There is no choice. And then in this era, as Kurosawa presents it, you're exactly right. The farmer's lot is not a particularly happy or prosperous one. We learn that they are likely to be exploited by either one of these factions. 
in samurai, once respectable, now a slightly tarnished class. And class is all over this. And the lowest rung on that ladder, as usual, is the laborer. These farmers have reached the point where they are faced with this choice. You die on your feet or live on your knees. And then from the other side, all of this to what end? You reference this a little bit too. The samurai will work themselves into obsolescence. If all the bandits are defeated, no one needs protection anymore. Tell me what that phrase was again. Die on your feet or live on your knees. Yeah. That needs to be our Italian cop movie title, don't you think? <laughs> I guarantee it probably already is. It must be. Well, in the filming as well, there were a lot of innovations. Telephoto lenses, multiple cameras, which is a pretty big deal, and that use of slow motion in specific shots. And Kurosawa edited as he went, which I think is incredibly brilliant. Can you imagine getting to the end of that year and faced with all that footage? If they're shooting that now, he's editing that on his MacBook Pro in the back seat of the car on the way to the hotel every night. But this, you're right, copious amounts of footage to go through and to assemble into this cohesive, super kinetic whole. And then there's the deep focus too. These interiors in particular, they really emphasize these beautiful compositions and choreography. You'll have a bowl of rice in the foreground prominently and then farmers sitting isolated and hungry in the corner and then some wild card like Kikuchio far in the back brooding but attentive to the dynamic in the room. And then Kurosawa will frequently employ physical barriers to tell the story too. A beam or a pillar will separate one character from the rest visually. A fence will do double duty as a barrier of protection and an implication of imprisonment. All of it in crystal clear focus, no matter the depth of the shot. And one other thing I want to mention about composition, you really pointed this out to me during high and low, and that's the compositions of twos and threes. And even when it's two farmers in the empty rice pot, or then the young samurai comes in to break up the action, it's just pervasive and so interesting to watch. And as opposed to something like when the camera moves to change composition, this is totally different. He is composing hundreds of shots here. And there's something else that I think is extra amazing about using the year to make this because we get to see the full agricultural year from the dust on the roads obscuring what's growing to the full flowering in the forest all the way to harvest. I think that is one of the things that really gets me and helps me understand what the stakes are. I feel like I'm living this with them. No matter how many times I watch this, I get a real sense of stakes. And it's unique in the way that it feels like there are no foregone conclusions. We know movie language. We've seen a ton of films. We know how to read these things. So most of the time, you know who will live, who will die, who will win, who will lose, all of that within the first 10 minutes. It's pretty telegraphed. But this isn't that easy to crack. It manages to surprise me a little bit every time. Is it the same for you? For sure. And as we both said, I've seen this multiple times and it does not get old. Now, speaking of putting the crew together, are you ready to meet the samurai? Yep. And this takes up basically the whole rest of the first half, which is awesome. We take the time to meet each of the samurai. First, that's the amazing Takashi Shimura as Kambe, who shaves off his top knot to pose as a monk to rescue a young boy from a kidnapper. And then my favorite spends the rest of the movie rubbing his head, first his bald head and then the ever growing back hair. Our friend, Roger Ebert, he speculated that this movie, this was the first time to introduce the main hero in a way that was unrelated to the main plot. Plus, we've got those other devices, the reluctant hero, the romance with the local and the youngest hero. Again, all of that stuff wasn't new, but got really combined here. So I mentioned Shimura as Kambe. We've also got Issei Kimura as Okamoto. We've got Mifune as Kikuchio, as you mentioned, Daisuke Kato as Sichiroji, Minoru Chiaki as Hayashida, Seji Miyaguchi as Kyozo, and Yoshio Inaba as Katayama. They all have different skills, they've all come from different places, some of them have previous relationships, and they're all very different people. So when you look at that seven, 
Is there a samurai you especially identify with? I would love to say Takashi Shimura just because I love him so much as Kambe. He's so wonderful. I cannot state that enough. And I love that episode that you mentioned in which we're introduced to him, shaving off that top knot, making that sacrifice. There's hope as long as there's one good man. He's resourceful, but he won't hesitate to kill when necessary. We learn a lot about him in a very short time. And he, I think, embodies the purest of the Bushido code. I think so. He's more humble and patient than I am, though, so identifying with him is more aspirational, maybe, than anything. Otherwise, Gorobe, maybe? He laughs more easily, and I choose him because I like his style, and also, I'm not a stone-faced killer or a mercurial rogue, which is the other end of the spectrum. Yeah, that's wrong. You're definitely a stone-faced killer. <laughs> But the interesting part of this question for me, I think, there may be a disconnect for me because there's just no way for me to adequately empathize. I'm sure there's a headspace inhabited by people whose lives are dictated by combat and violence that the rest of us just cannot grasp. So do I even want to be able to identify with that? I wrestle with this and then hence I relate more to the characters based on what they do in the quiet moments. What about you? Well, I'm still going to say that I think you're most like Kyozo because of those quiet moments when you see him sit down because it's time to rest, put his head down, and do it. That's what I envision you doing. I mean, really, I guess I'm probably Okamoto, the youngest, the goofiest, the one most likely to be found in a daisy field taking a nap. But I love all of them. I find the moment that's most poignant for me is talking about Well, I'm not so good at this skill, so I try to avoid it at all costs. That's probably me. So we've talked about all of these different tropes or devices that we now recognize as something that we've lived with forever, it seems like, starting from this film, coalescing from this film, I should say, like the assembling the team. So what is it like when you essentially start the trope? Because I was just rewatching some stuff like the remake of The Italian Job, all the way to the Justice League. We just see this stuff all the time now. The way I see it playing out is like you often see with things. I was actually just thinking about this with the Velvet Underground because of that documentary. You have the person that does it first or best, and then you just have a series of pale imitations. The care that Kurosawa takes with this is essential. You mentioned he spends the first half of the film, a long film, on this And I think the real secret weapon here is having Shimura as his avatar. That sells it. He guides us through this process, and then seeing through his eyes helps us completely understand. You can't just fill in slots. Well, you mentioned some of these other movies. I guess you can, but you end up with a garbage movie. But we feel who these guys are. Haihachi will be a treasure in hard times. So when he dies, we know hard times are just beginning. And without this process and how much time we spend watching the team evolve, we wouldn't fully get, not in the same way at least, that losing Gorobe is like losing your heart and soul for this team. The acting process for me here is just extraordinary. I mean, let's talk about Toshiro Mufune. Apparently he watched footage of lions to get ready for his character, and I could see it. And personally, I have seen very few things as astonishing as when he breaks down at the moment where the mother surrenders the baby. That's amazing. Toshiro Mifune is just a miracle to me. A -a one-of-a-kind performer. There will never be anyone else like him. A study I was looking at not too long ago identified that there are 21 potential facial expressions that humans can make. And that number varies a little bit depending on what you read. But let's say we accept that number at 21 If that's the case, Mifune has to be capable of at least 40, I feel like. He can do things large and small with facial expressions that other performers need their whole body for. So when we talk again about this movie being first or best or whatever, we are really talking about the use of archetypes here. Even though they're based on historical samurai, they each embody something. So when do you feel like the use of archetypes has run its course? Or can it ever run its course? I'm more in the camp that it will never run its course. There are seven stories that humans tell, basically, like the 21 facial expressions. We only have a limited number of plots. So 
it will only give us more clever twists and treatments of those ideas. What I'm most interested in in this case is the specifically Japanese take on this. I've seen the Japanese character surrounding this kind of thing described as masochistic perseverance in the fulfillment of complex social obligations being a basic cultural trait in Japan. That seems like a pretty darn good breakdown. So everyone here is playing out the role they've been assigned by society. And this answers one of my most basic questions that I have when I'm watching the film. Why do the bandits continue? Surely there are easier targets, especially needing to reconsider after suffering so many losses. But what else are they going to do? Bandits are going to bandit, right? Yeah, and they can only get so far on those horses. It's like Butch and Sundance doing the same bank twice. But there are just so many small and large character moments here. We see them explored in private and in front of a cast of hundreds. It truly is epic. I want to talk again just for a second about that idea of Kurosawa upending how we see samurai. Taking away those false heroics. Like when Kambe and Shichiroji are talking about being on the losing side of a battle. Shijiroji says, I hid among the grasses in the mode until dark. It's pretty great. And we talked about Haihachi a moment ago. He has this great line, there's no cutting me off when I start cutting, so I make it a point to run away first. And you look at all of these samurai, and unlike other films, I don't think anybody would particularly want to be in their place here. Except maybe Katsushiro, because he's such a wannabe. You're absolutely right about all the things you can glean in these large and small moments. One of my absolute favorite character details is Mifune's ridiculous sword of overcompensation, that huge sword he carries. And then I just love Kurosawa's patience in establishing and exploring this group dynamic, their motivation for joining, how they sort ambition from noble behavior. And we're left with one of these big questions. If mercenaries happen to choose the noble path solely because there is a bowl of rice at the end of it, does it make it any less noble? But it's so fun to watch this play out. They try to run Mufune off almost like a dog, like you would throw rocks at him to tell him to go back home. He's a gesture to start with, and slowly but surely becomes indispensable. Because when he plants their banner, their battle standard... Up on that roof, it is one of the most stirring and inspirational moments of any film I've ever seen. Well, speaking of stirring, can we talk about maybe what is my single favorite element of the film, especially in this viewing, and that is the music. A couple of angles here with the music. The samurai theme that was composed by Fumio Hayasaka, and it was a piece that he had originally actually discarded, which is amazing to think about now. But... You know me. Going back to Andrei Rublev, I love the use of non-lexical vocables for the farmers. It expresses their degradation. And then we have all of these variations of their percussion. And then, what's maybe the best moment, those two themes intersect. We have that percussion overlay when they're on the journey to the village that combines with their western theme. Western being how Hayasaka looked at the samurai theme. He was incorporating more of a Western feel to it, not as in Western as in cowboys. So once the team is assembled, the film becomes about trying to get the farmers ready and get the village fortified in time, because I mentioned the clock is ticking. One of the surprises that I always enjoy encountering is that Rikichi has this ally that he wasn't necessarily expecting with the old man in the mill. I think the farmers capitulated to going to see him because they thought he would say, run, hide, leave. He would not say fight, and he surprised everyone. So wisdom is speaking there. He says, we'll fight, hire samurai, find hungry samurai. So we know it's a universal motivator, hunger, and that hunger informs and corrupts this world as we know it, specifically the barley. The barley is a perfect example of how these metaphors get turned. It takes what is typically a symbol of bounty and then turns it into a countdown clock to terror. And all the while the clock is ticking down, we continue to meet characters. We get other story arcs like the cycle of farming, young love played against it. Another favorite moment here for me surrounding that. I love that Rikichi speaks up 
and defends this when Katsushiro and Shino have their tryst. I like it for two reasons. It addresses the very real prospect of what people may do when they think they're about to see their last sunrise ever. So it's true to human nature. And then also, it's another indication of changing times and social standards. It's what you were talking about before. How much of that theme is paralleling post-war social shifts in Japan? Possibly my favorite side character is the old woman who wants to die soon because her entire family has been wiped out. And then her moment for vengeance that comes later. But suddenly, it's 10 days until the harvest, and they've got to flood these fields in order to create a moat. Does 10 days feel like enough to prepare for the fight of your life? Is there ever enough time for this? I don't think I could learn jujitsu in that amount of time. And then let's talk about the village itself and that dynamic. Because some people have been told to move out of their houses so there's less to protect. You have to consolidate the area that you have to defend. Because defense is harder than offense. So Kambe has this strategy that has everyone working in squads. And that's different squads from different parts of the village to protect each other. And that also means, like I said, some areas will get sacrificed. Yeah, you have to see the bigger picture. I love this bit of wisdom. Your head is on the block and all you think of is your whiskers. But does it take experience to formulate, to develop this plan, to stick to this plan? Do you think the farmers would have been completely incapable on their own? I do, because still some, when the going gets even rougher, they want to rebel against this plan. They only want to protect what is theirs, at least in their mind. Yeah. Coming back to that subject of crises of faith, this mill, for example, this exists as possibly their most sacred place, and it will have to be sacrificed. But I still understand this community trauma that has taken place. Because we see it when one of the bandits gets captured, there is a decision to be made whether to kill him. Yeah, I'm trying to think of all the best adjectives to describe where these farmers are. I think wretched is probably the best description of what they've been reduced to, how they're living. And then the samurai, they've become part of the village to a degree by now, but there'll always be this separation. These samurai, they're destined to wander, always without a true home. They've earned a rest that will only come with their death. And then to balance out all this trauma, though, I was going to ask you this. These moments of comic relief that we see, there's a couple of them at least. My favorite is with the horse. Do you feel like this is realistic? Does it take you out of the movie, or is it reasonable to imagine that there would be lighter moments that you could steal in the face of this overwhelming danger? There have to be lighter moments. I think anybody in these situations throughout history has stated that those things do actually exist. Because otherwise, wouldn't everyone have just committed suicide in mass days ago? But no, they are very much still in the fight here. They have raided the bandit's fort, and they've learned that the crew has three muskets, which is a very big deal. Again, commentary on that Western influence. Maybe these shifts that are happening in society in 1954 echo all the way back to the 16th century. So the samurai set about systematically whittling those bandit numbers down. And as the rains come, there are only about 13 of them left. Isn't it so satisfying to watch him put those X's on that map? Hell yeah, it is. And the order is given, let them all in. The bandits are decimated, but that's not without the losses among the samurai and the villagers. But the village is, in fact, safe again for planting. And the community comes together in a really satisfying way through music to celebrate and work. I don't know that I read that as pleasantly as you do. I get a real sense from Shino, at least, that she's on the verge of tears, that this is a very bittersweet ending. Yeah, definitely bittersweet, but still satisfying to me. I mean, you know I still like some trauma, because watching the last three samurai look on the field of the dead as they see the village come together and they acknowledge this victory really belongs to the peasants, which doesn't make life any easier. No. I'm hesitant to even call it victory. This ending, appropriately, I feel like, does not feel like a triumph in any way whatsoever. But just like your previous question, you have to keep moving forward somehow. If there's still an element of hope, you can keep standing. 
Hey, before we get out of here, did you notice none of the seven samurai are killed in sword fights? All four samurai who die are killed by the musket. I don't think I ever noticed that before. That is an indictment, I feel like, now that you point that out to me. Well, man, that was a great experience. I'm so glad we watched that. On the lighter side, do you want to know what else came out in 1954 that was awesome? Oh, I know what came out in 1954. It was a huge year, even just in Japan. For sure. Tell me. Seven Samurai, Sancho the Bailiff, Godzilla, A Story from Chikamatsu, 24 Eyes. And then we go outside Japan, you've got Rear Window, La Strada, Magnificent Obsession, The Cane Mutiny, Creature from the Black Lagoon, Hobson's Choice, Johnny Guitar. On the waterfront. And one I know that you love, them! You got point. it. Did you know that Kurosawa visited the Godzilla set? Yes, I did. I've seen that. Wouldn't that be awesome to have been a fly on that wall? So I kicked off this conversation by talking about what a foundational film this is. Like I said, been copied, paid homage to, referred to a million times. Probably one that people know the most would be The Magnificent Seven from 1960. It took the story, adapted it to the Old West. But Kurosawa said he didn't think it was the same story. But anyway, we'll set that aside. So I don't know if it's that direct link in my mind, but it gets me thinking about all of those epics that I grew up with that told these big stories. And I tend to think of them as mostly Westerns, at least until the 1970s when you have something like The Godfather. But if we take that connection on faith, why do you think Westerns dominated the genre for us Americans? Because epics are about myth-making, and there's no better place to do that for us in the first half of the 20th century than the American West. And all kinds of factors contribute to that. You need room to spread out to tell these stories, and that's where our expanse was. But I think most important of all, when it comes to the myth of the American West, we really have to dig into this idea of history being written by the victors. I think the people that are making those films and trying to sell these ideas see that as the perfect blank canvas. You know what? I really hadn't thought of it that way, and I'm so glad that you brought that up. Now, I need your other opinion on something. You have to weigh in on this because I have to abstain. So here's the question. Why do you have to abstain? I'll tell you in just a second. Okay. So Kinema Junpo, which is Japan's oldest and most respected film magazine, ranked Seven Samurai as the second best Japanese film of all time behind Tokyo Story, which I still haven't seen. Ah, okay. So that's why I don't get an opinion on this one. I have no problem with that assessment. I think that's actually pretty accurate. I think that list, I looked at that list, it is stacked from top to bottom. Kurosawa has five films in the top 15. Quite rightly. The only quibble I had with it, I would rate Ikiru higher than they do, but otherwise I'm perfectly fine with everything on that list and where it sits. Okay, so we'll get everybody in the Facebook group to weigh in too. Tell me what you think. I do want to throw this in there though, because I love this. Kurosawa said of this film, it's a movie as rich as a buttered steak topped with grilled eel. That just makes me want to go back to Japan and get the full eel meal from one of the street vendors that we passed that day. I'll just take the eel, leave the steak. Now, it wouldn't be an episode of the Magic Lantern podcast if I didn't mention our old killjoy friend, Bosley Crowther. Oh God, what did he have to say about this? Oh Jesus. You can probably guess. Okay, so the film is quite long. Worth every minute, in my opinion. Bosley Crowther, though, in his review said, it is much too long for comfort or for the story it has to tell. Speak for your own lazy ass, Bosley Crowther. You did pick a doozy here for us to watch. Is this the longest film that we've done? It probably is, right? Andre Rublev's longer, Uh, right? Right, I think you're right. But I love a good intermission. Who doesn't love a good intermission? Bosley Crowther, I guess. I guess. Apparently they were out of jujubes at the concession stand. Well, I am so happy that you picked this. I know it hasn't been that long since I've seen it, but any time I get the opportunity to put it on, it is always a blast to return to. It's thrilling, and it's human. And here's what I love most about Akira Kurosawa. He's in the Pantheon, obviously. Bergman, Fellini, Tarkovsky, Bunuel. He is up there with the greats. But I love... 
that this titan of international art house is, at heart, a genre director. He makes crime films, he makes action films. Some of those other names I mentioned can be occasionally a little ponderous or difficult to approach, but Kurosawa made movies for the people. He's like one of his heroes, John Ford. He made entertainments first, but all without sacrificing complicated themes and this exquisite craftsmanship. I love that he is equally at home with being as pulpy as Sam Fuller and then dealing with the pulp on the other end of Shakespeare and still be on that art house Mount Rushmore. You said it, Padna. So what did you pick for your recommendation? I picked something that you need to see right away. In fact, I'm in the mood to put this on as soon as we press stop on the recording here. I chose The Sword of Doom from 1966. That's directed by Kihachi Okamoto, and it stars Tatsuya Nakadai and Toshiro Mifune again. It's about a wandering samurai who is amoral, to be diplomatic, who finds himself surrounded by the reverberations of his own violence until it drives him insane. This takes Kurosawa's gray area anti-hero idea to its absolute terminal point. It is one of the greatest and most nihilistic samurai movies ever made. And I don't use this phrase very often, but this is a tour de force performance from Tatsuya Nakadai. Mifune is the noble, rigid, upright character this time, and it's something to see watching the two of them in relation to one another. Because while Mifune is this upstanding beacon, you see Nakadai insinuating himself into all the darkest corners of human behavior. And behind the camera, Okamoto is no slouch either. We talk about Kurosawa's skills with composition, especially with something like High and Low, but Okamoto keeps pace with him here. It's a little more otherworldly and feverish than Seven Samurai, but there is not a boring frame in this movie. Highly recommend it if you want to explore the samurai genre in more depth and see how dark things can actually get. What about you? Well, you sold me on the Sword of Doom. I, though, picked one of the great putting the crew together films. And that is The Dirty Dozen from 1967, directed by Robert Aldrich with Lee Marvin, Richard Jekyll, Ernest Borgnine, Charles Bronson, Jim Brown, John Cassavetes, George Kennedy, Robert Ryan, Telly Savalas, Robert Weber, and Donald Sutherland. Your favorite, John Cassavetes, was nominated for Best Supporting Actor in this one. It's about a secret suicide mission in March 1944 that targets a French chateau that is housing a bunch of high-ranking German officers. So eliminating these officers should disrupt the chain of command before the Allied invasion on D-Day. An OSS officer who's Lee Marvin is tasked with putting the team together from the Army's worst prisoners, and if any survive, they will receive pardons for their crimes, including some who have been sentenced to death. So this is the original Suicide Squad, essentially. Kind of sounds like it. Actually, now I want to watch this, too. Do we have time to watch all these movies tonight? It's pretty dang fun. This was probably maybe for you, too. This was a Sunday afternoon with my mm -hmm. dad kind of a movie. Yep. And there is a lot to love here. Most notably, just like with Seven Samurai, it is all about the performances. Lee Marvin can whip my crew into shape any day. And John Cassavetes eyeing up those dilapidated prostitutes, that is a one for the books. So once again, that's two great recommendations, The Sword of Doom and The Dirty Dozen. And that brings us to the end of episode 171. If what we do here is valuable to you and you would like to support that, we would certainly love for you to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash magiclantern. The $5 a month level gets you access to a big backlog of bonus episodes, and those come out on the Mondays alternating with regular episodes, so you never have to go a week without new Magic Lantern in your life. We've also added a simple donation button to the website, so if Patreon is not your thing and you'd rather just make a one-time PayPal donation to help keep the lantern lit, you can go to magiclanternpodcast.com and just look for the donate button in the upper right corner under the header, and that's in the main drop-down menu if you're on a mobile device. As always, we appreciate everyone's support so much. If you would just like to get in touch with us, you can reach us via email at magiclanternpodcast at gmail.com. We are on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, and TikTok. Just search for Magic Lantern Podcast on any of those platforms. We are on Twitter at Lantern underscore cast, and I just wanted to take a second to say thanks to everyone who has shared the show or given us feedback since last time. 
especially Spencer Seams, who I want to thank once again for having me on his podcast, the Shoot the Piano Player podcast, to talk about Purple Noon and Mario Baba's Black Sunday. Also, thanks to Lindsay Murray. If you're sharing the show or talking about us, please make sure to tag us so we can say thanks. You can find our show on Audible, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher Radio, Spotify, just about anywhere you get your podcasts, you can find us. If you'd like to leave us a rating or review via any of those services, we would certainly appreciate that. And finally, you can find all of our episodes, including supplemental material, at the website magiclanternpodcast.com. And thank you for listening to the Magic Lantern Podcast. 